Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, asking that your word will come forth upon our hearts. Lord God, let us be receptive to what you have to say. You've spoken to us, Heavenly Father, through your words upon these pages. Let us now hear them, Lord God, and receive them within our hearts. We ask all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, welcome all y'all. Glad to have you out today. Beautiful weather. No excuses. We had nowhere else to go. Here we are. I'm starting this morning on a series. We're getting to look at the, the book of James. I'm going to encourage you to bring your Bibles with you when you be able to come in the weeks to come. As a matter of fact, I encourage you to bring your Bible with you every time you come to church. Anything I say here, make sure you check it against the Word of God. If I'm wrong, you come find me and you tell me. I'm going to put that upon y'all to be able to do that. It's going to be a different series of messages than you're used to receiving from me in the past year or so since I've been here. We're going to look at the book of James. We're going to kind of go through it verse by verse. Those of you who come to Sunday school know that that's pretty much the way we do it in Sunday school. It's considered to be, you know, expository, and I'm usually more of a topical preacher, even textual, taking a bit of a text. But we're going to go through and let, the, let James lead us all the way through the book that he's written. So I said, okay, if we're going to do this and do something different, why would I start with James? You have to understand this. You may say, you know, it's hard to be able to get enough reading done in a week, or I don't know how many of you read your Bible every day. But I have to tell you, it's even hard for the preacher to be able to find time and to be able to get into study. There's a difference between reading your Bible and studying your Bible. For a preacher, there's something different between reading your Bible to come up with the sermon that you need to be, that God's given to you, and the difference in the reading that's in my own time and what speaks to me. And I've got to admit that when my reading... I've always kind of stayed away from the book of James. I had a preacher tell me one time, he said, you have to be very, very careful when you read the book of James. If you're not careful, by the time you get to the end, you will be saved. <laughs> so I'm just telling you all, if you, I'm your forewarned. If you begin to read James, if you can make it all the way through, by the end, you'll probably be saved. It stands apart from any other New Testament reading. When you begin to read the other books in the New Testament, there's just something different about James. And you can tell. It's just, you don't know what it is. It, just, it speaks different to your spirit. When we begin to look at, at James, we begin to wonder, okay, what, what was so different about it? Just to give you an example, this week is um, October 31st. What happens on October 31st? You get two days on some of your calendar. You have Halloween ready. And the other one for my Lutheran brothers is um, Reformation Day. That's the day that Martin Luther went and tacked up his 95 theses on the door of the church. And he told them what he had, what he thought about what they had going on. He pointed that out to them. He's the father of Reformation, the father of Protestantism. He had a lot of issues with James. But the main thing, if you begin to get into James, and it kind of has a central theme, James 2.26 tells us what? It tells us that faith without works is dead. Well, at the time that Martin Luther was nailing in the, up on the church door, everything was expressed was just works. The church had fallen in love with just works, 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 works. Your salvation is not by works. You have to do this, you have to do that, you have this day, that day. And it just became something of pure work. There was no grace involved. So James kind of worried Martin Luther because he's worried that they fall back into that of works. But it's not. That's not what James is telling us. And we'll see that as we begin to get into what James has to say. Because we'll begin to look that works become the symbol of our faith. It begins to put our faith into action. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning too. If we just have faith but we have no action, we have nothing. For us to be Christians, we have to be existing to do something. We are Christ's light, and Christ was action. Everything we read and to read about Christ, there was action. We talked about Sunday school again this morning. That Christ himself never preached a funeral. That no one ever came to Christ and limped away. We see full restorations. We see life. 
And if we are Christians, which means Christ-like, then the same thing happens within our own lives. First thing we look at, I guess it's going to bring it up, is who was James? Does anyone even know who James was? Let's go to James chapter 1. Let's start with verse 1. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. James. He gives his name in the first line. Who was James? James was a brother of Jesus. James was a half-brother of Jesus. We know in reading scriptures that Jesus had brothers and he had sisters. We have names given to two of his brothers. We know James and Jude, who were brothers of Jesus. An interesting thing about James, though, is that James did not accept Christ as the Savior until after Christ's death, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. Any of you that have siblings, can you understand that possibly he would not admit that his brother was the Son of God? That his brother was the high and mighty, that his older brother was the head of everything. He may have had trouble with that. But eventually, after the resurrection, James did become a believer in Christ. Not only that, but James became the bishop and the leader of the church in Jerusalem. James is listed throughout church history as being a mighty pillar of the faith. So he had troubles. So he was maybe a little bit hard-headed, but you know what? If you've got siblings that are like that, there's hope. Keep praying for them. Understand that Jesus himself was unable to convert his own siblings while he lived. Keep praying for them. And the thing is, look, if you came to life to Christ late in your life, that's all right. He's still got lots for you to be able to do. Don't worry about that. Verse 2, James tells us this. He said, Account it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. Count it all joy. Earlier in the service, we come to the point of the service that I really like, where we get to express our joy for the things that God has done for us. Express the wonderful things. We're so thankful, Lord God. Did anyone stand up and raise your hand and say, I'm so thankful that God tested me this week. I am so thankful that I had a horrible day in my job, in my endeavor. I'm so thankful that he gave me the opportunity to turn it all over to him. I'm so glad that I had a bad week. I didn't hear it. Maybe next week I'll hear it, but I didn't hear it. But James was counted all the joy when you meet trials of various kinds. Verse 3, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. I like the word steadfastness because it doesn't really apply to me. I'm not worried about it. But when I begin to look into the word, find out what steadfastness means, it actually means patience. How many of you in here lack patience? How many of you know people in this building that lack patience? I may say I have patience. My wife would probably say otherwise. How many of you could use more patience? James says, for you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So how is it produced? How do we get more? We get more through trials. We get more through testing. We get more patience by going through bad weeks and bad times. We get patience when we get in the line at a Walmart, Jerry. Y'all need to come to Sunday school. You get to hear some pretty good stories about how everybody's week went. And when you're in the line, you go all the way through the line there, Jerry, and you get up to the front, and then you time say, what, cash only? <laughs> That's all right. Jerry showed his Christ-like nature. He got out of the line, went to another line. That's all we do. We have patience with people. You do realize that Walmart tellers have bad days, too? Yeah. We might can kind of give them a little bit of our patience Always. back. Always. There you go. No thank yous, no nothing. Always tell your people thank you. Especially when they say you can come in the line anyway, my dear. That's right. Verse 4 And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. Not just patience, but perfect patience. I can be patient. If I'm waiting at the bank and I'm cashing a check and they're going to give me back money, I can be patient. Not a problem with that. 
If I'm at the pharmacy and I know I'm calling in my order, I know it's supposed to be there, and they said it was ready, and I get there, my order's still not ready, Jerry. <laughs> I might not be so patient because I know they're going to pass it up the line to the doctor, to the nurse. At some point, they'll blame the computer system that didn't come through. Then they'll blame my insurance. They'll blame everybody but the pharmacist, but that's the only one I'm there to see, so that's the only one I can blame. It says that my patience will be made perfect. I can be patient at all times. When you got married, you stood at the, at the head of the, of the aisle there, and your, your bride came down, walked very slow. But you know what? That's how it's supposed to be. So we were there. We were patient. It's a beautiful moment. Let's jump a few years forward. We gotta go. We gotta beat traffic. You know how bad every traffic is. It's game day. Let's go. We've got to go. We've got to go now. They're still getting all their stuff together. Come on, come on. Now in our scenario, it'd usually be me. She would be already in the car and take send me a text. I'm in the car. <laughs> It'll be me. There's just things I have to catch up on. But we have to perfect our patience. Lacking in nothing. We can't just have some patience. Fully, complete. How do we know if our patience is complete? How do we know if we built ourselves up to it? The patience that we carry with us is enough patience. When you leave the house in the morning, you grab your keys. I got my keys. I mean, well, I have my keys. I rode with you. But I've got all my keys. They're in my pocket. I don't just have my truck key to get in the truck. I have the keys to work. I have the keys to lock the house. I have all my keys, everything there. Whenever we leave, and one of the gifts of the Spirit, and the fruits of the Spirit, one of the things is patience. Okay, I've got everything I've made. I've got love. I've got kind. I love everybody. Did I bring my patience with me? Oh, I forgot that one. Bring everything with you. And we know it is complete because it is tested. I had my truck keys. I had everything this morning. My house keys. We get to church this morning. Don't have the church keys. It's all right. Like we leave close. We come back, turn around, come back. How do we know? How did I know that I didn't have my church keys? I got here and the door was locked. There's my test. Okay, easy enough. I can't get in. The same way to know if our patience is perfected is that God's going to give us tests every day throughout the week. You say, oh, I said God tempts no one. I didn't say tempt. I said tested. Understand that there's a difference. We have to test our faith to make sure that it works. How many of you ever pick up a cordless drill and pick it up? What's the first thing you do when you pick up a cordless drill? Pull the trigger a couple of times. If you used to watch Home Improvement, Tim the Two Man Taylor, you pull it a couple of times and you grunt. You're a man. That's what we do. That's just what we do. If we have a stud finder, we pick it up on the wall, we put it in our chest first and make the beeping noise. It's just what we do. So you test it. You want to make sure that it works before you get up on the ladder and you have to go through everything. You got to make sure that it actually works. If you ever work in a job where you have a plant and something's actually produced, they're going to have quality control, which everything goes through, and they test the item before it, before it actually gets to the end of the line. You know, I bought a washing machine, had water in it, so we test it before it leaves. I don't believe that, but anyway, somebody would think I should pour water in it, but they said, oh yeah, we test every washing machine before it leaves. I said, no, you don't. But anyway, quality control means you're going to test it. Put everything in a situation to see if it actually works. The same thing comes in that line about our patience. It must be tested. It's going to be taken from one extreme to the other. You're going to find out where the limits of your patience are. If you have kids, they're always going to know just where the boundaries of your patience are. If you have employees, they're going to find just the boundaries of your patience. They're going to take you from one extreme to the other. Hey, you're a blacksmith. You work metal. My understanding is if you want to harden something, you're going to take it, get it up to a high heat, you're going to work it, and you're also immediately going to put it into another extreme. Water, snow, whatever you have available to you, you're going to go from the highest temperature to the lowest temperature you possibly can to be able to temper, I guess it's temper, to be able to get that strength in there. God's going to do the same thing to us. Do not be amazed when your test comes at your highest level. When things are going great, you got a new job. Here it is. Man, this is wonderful. I'm, I'm way up here. And all of a sudden, something hits you. One extreme to the other. That's where we find out where our patience is truly tested. If we truly put that bit of Christ within us. 
Whenever they do that to the metal, my reading is it actually changes the molecules. Things realign. It's just amazing the things that they place within a piece of metal. God made that metal. How much more so is he going to do that to us? It becomes something different than what started out. All of us, when we've accepted Christ, it becomes something different than what started out. We're totally made anew. God's going to take us from our comfort zone sometimes. So wonderful this morning, I walked into church. I said, Daryl, I didn't touch the thermostat. I didn't turn the air on, the heat on. I, I did nothing. Nothing. He says, all right. He said, it's good. It's where it needs to be. Whenever you find yourself like that, perfect, just where you need to be, start watching. Something's coming up. A test from God, a temptation from the devil. Somebody is fixing to upset your comfort zone. You can be sure. <clears throat> you may have a good day, a bad day, a hot day, a cold day. Something is coming. But never forget the temptation is of the devil, but tests are of God. Teacher gives you a test. The good, nice teacher that Miss Pat is. Not what you said they called you earlier this morning. But the good, nice teacher. She gives you tests because she wants to make sure that you've learned. Not to flunk you out. Not to send you home. You've got a parent-teacher conference. They're going to ask you, why is my kid doing bad? They don't want to hear the answer. You have to give them a answer. They may not want to hear the real answer. But tests are important. How do we survive the tests that come into our lives? How do we pass the test? Let's look at verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given unto him. We persevere and we pass the tests that are put into our lives by one simple way. We pray. And what do we ask for? It says in here, James, to ask for wisdom. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. When God came to him and said, Solomon, I love you. I love your dad. I'll give you anything you want. What do you want? And Solomon asked for what? Wisdom. Which showed that he already possessed what? Wisdom. We have to thank God for the good days. We thank God for the bad days. We remember that the God on the mountain is the same as the God in the valley, as my mother-in-law sung for so many years. We have to realize that and be thankful for what he's done for us. It's okay to ask for wisdom. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room. I'm going to challenge you this. If you are the smartest person in your group of friends, you need new friends. I'm just telling you, if you have a group that you have nowhere that you can learn nothing from, you need a new group of friends. If you're lacking in wisdom, God will bring you what you need. Verse 6 says, But let him ask in faith, with no doubt. So don't just pray. Don't just go for him and say, God, give me wisdom. Come in, James says here, ask in faith. No doubting. We ask in faith, although it's already, as if it's already done. It's, it's, it's a done deal. I walk into the bank, like I said earlier, and I give them my check. I say, I need to cash this check. I have faith. What's going to happen? When I leave out of the bank, they're going to give me that cash. I've got faith in people. I've got faith in banks. I've got faith in pharmacists. You know, why more greater faith should I have in God? I don't know what's in that bottle. I don't know what's in that bag when I go to the pharmacy. I really don't. I know there's a label on it. I don't know. But I can be sure that everything that God gives me, hands to me, is what I need. Me and Chris, one day, day Chris come out of the restaurant industry, and there's two assumptions you can make. One is that you go to McDonald's, Marcy knows, if you go to McDonald's and get an order and you get into that window, they hand you that order out the window and you drive off, you know without a doubt something's not right. <laughs> I was on the phone with her. She calls me. She drives to school. She said, I know this. Is, I know they gave me the wrong tea. She tasted it. They gave me the wrong tea. I said, why would you drive off from the window? You know without a doubt you will get the wrong thing. No matter what. The other side of the coin, if you go to Chick-fil-A and you place an order at Chick-fil-A, they hand you that order out the window. You know without a doubt you will get in that bag what you ordered. And I read something the other day, even better. It said not only that, if I go to Chick-fil-A and they give me something that I didn't order, I know that they love me enough and care for me enough that they gave me what I needed and not what I wanted. <laughs> I said, there you go. Exactly right. That's the kind of faith that I need to have. And no matter what comes to that window, I'm going to eat it and it's what was best for me. <laughs> but do we have the same faith in God? 
When he brings stuff to us, we say, oh, no, no, that's not what I want. That's not what I asked for. God, who cares so much more for us. We have to come to him in faith with no doubt. It's as if when James, remember James wrote this, and James rejected Christ. Understand that. But when James wrote that, it's like he finally listened in his mind to the words of his brother that Jesus had told him. And they saw him. Because Jesus said in Matthew 21, 22, whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Mark eleven twenty four, 24, Jesus said, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Asking, already knowing that you've received it. James 6 verse, the B part says, For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Wishy-washy, we used to call that. Somebody that wavers in what they do in their consistency. We may have employees that are like that. We may have students that are like that. We may have our own children. People we know that are never consistent in what they say they're going to bring to us. You cannot be like that. It's like the waves of the sea, he says. We all know someone that's like that. It has no consistency in them at all. But verse 7, James says this, For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Sometimes people look at, okay, what are our rewards to be when we get to heaven? Some people say, well, we'll have this, I'm going to have this. How many, you speak a song, what do you say? say, how many stars will I have in my crown? Is that what they have the hand with? How many stars will I have in my crown? Used to be the old Baptist and Methodist church next door in Alexandria. And they used to sing a song with the windows open. How many stars will I have in my crown? And the other church said, no, not one, my Lord. No, not one. <laughs> but we begin to wonder, how is God going to reward me? How is he going to reward me? It says to me right here, for the person that is wishy-washy, the person that's tossed away that has doubt, do not suppose that they will receive anything from the Lord. Some people think that they're okay, that they're just going to sneak into heaven. I'm not going to have any crowns. I'm not going to have a mansion. I'm not going to have anything. I'm just going to get in the door and sit down. That's my plan. I don't read that. I don't see where people get in that way. You see how people that get into heaven smell like smoke. That's just how close they were. I don't read that. I read that the people of faith are the ones who enter in. Verse 8, he says, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. All of his ways. He's not just talking about the prayer life of faith. He's talking about every aspect of his life. I know that's how he is. You do know that whenever you begin to see things in your life that you're not doing the right way, it will show up in other areas of your life. I got up to where I was about 60 pounds heavier than I am. I got huge. It wasn't just the fact of showing the fact that I wasn't eating right, I wasn't managing myself, my diabetes was out of control. I promise you, if I begin to dig into my prayer life, my Bible study, my interactions with other Christians, I wasn't just neglecting my health, I was neglecting my spirit. He says here that he is unstable in all of his ways. The things that we show that we don't think are important are important because we have to be complete in the way that we live our lives for Christ. The double-minded man has no focus. He's unable to stay on task. I was thinking of something else. They're distracted. You know, students like that in school, maybe? You know people like that? What do we do now? Medicate them. They're distracted. They have no attention. They have attention deficit. I kind of looked at them and said, I think I have attention hyperactivity on the other side because I pay attention to everything, which makes it almost impossible to pay attention to the one thing. It's not that I feel like a deficit. It's just that there's so much stimulus comes in from everywhere. We're surrounded by it all the time. We're distracted, off task. But you know what? That is at the core of what the mind of a hypocrite is. They think about the things of Christ and they do the things of the world. They may say something on Sunday, but they're going to walk out and leave something in a totally different life. They'll stand up and proclaim in the Apostles' Creed, they'll name the Word of God, they'll sing the songs, but yet the days of the week, the only time they ever use the Word God is following what they think apparently is His last name. I'm not going to repeat it, but that's the only other time you ever see them say God in the other part of the week is in a sign of a curse. 
Verse 9, let's get through here. Verse 9, James says, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flowers fall and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Y'all know the stories. I'm not a pity. Y'all know that I get up. I go ride a bike several days a week. That's just what I do to try and tend to one part of my body. One part of my life, my health. I needed cardio. I needed something to keep going. So I do. I ride bikes. I go and I train. I've been doing it since May. Yesterday we had a race. You know, and I actually, I want to... But I want a place. I got a little medal. I almost wore it to church. I thought about it. I got a little medal, you know, wherever I'm at. Look at me. I've got something here. You know, I've got something for all that I've done. I got tons of likes on Facebook. Like I said, I could have took my medal. I could have went back to McDonald's, and I couldn't even got a cup of coffee with it. It had no value. But you know what? It was all right to me. It showed me that what I did was working. The fact that I persevered and I went through, I managed to get something done. And understand pursuits and goals, all of those things, those are fine. I actually do it, and I put it up because I try to encourage other people. I have other people now that I know that are friends of mine that come and they work out the same place that I do. Just to begin to encourage other people and show by example. But you know, all these things that we do are, are just temporary if they don't in some way bring us closer to Christ. Everything that I do, the people I interact with at the gym that I've never seen anywhere else, I try and bring some Christ into their life because they don't know me. They never knew me. But the fact that I'm there and I'm consistent and they see that I'm consistent and I take the things that they take serious, serious, they actually begin to listen to me. It's a way to draw others into Christ. But it's not totally secular on the race yesterday. You understand, there was a lot of praying yesterday if y'all knew what the weather was um, before 8 o'clock yesterday morning. There were lots and lots of prayers. And we're very specific in our prayers. Please, Lord God, let the rain stop. We started at 8 o'clock. No rain. No one remembered to pray that there would be no wind. <laughs> Any of you who know weather, I know nothing about weather, but apparently when a front comes in, behind it comes the wind. Cold wasn't bad. The wind was absolutely brutal. So there was lots of praying that I took place as I rode. Well, especially when we came back going in, how will I tell when we went back? Coming back, there's a lot of praying, Lord, now please, please stop this wind. You're just sitting there and you can't go anywhere. So there were a lot of prayers said that day. But I began to look back and see, I got my little medal on hand, and I said, okay, what got me to this point? Because in May, I was just on the couch. I could do nothing. I could barely finish a workout. What got me to the point is that for six hours a week, I ride a bike. Minimum six hours a week, I'm riding a bike. I'm riding a bike. I'm putting in a mile. But I began to think, okay, how many hours a week am I spending in God's Word? How many hours a week am I spending in prayer? How many weeks am I spending, how many hours a week am I spending, spending in visitation? You know, spreading the Word of God specifically to other people. Where am I devoting my time to? Because you should say, if you ever want to know important in someone's life, you look at two things. You look at their checkbook and their calendar. So I purposely put in six hours of my week. That it's hard to get. I mean, I get up at 3.45. That's the only way I can find it. But do I need to get up at 3.30, 3, to get my Bible study time in, my prayer time in? Isn't that just as important? Isn't that much more important? Verse 12, James said, Blessed is a man who remains steadfast, who perseveres under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. If we persevere in our faith. You realize we've showed up here. Most of us here have accepted Christ. But we must persevere. We must withstand the tests. The tests that are going to come. The tests that I'm going to challenge you to actually pray for. What did David say? He said, Lord God. See if there be within me any wicked way. Try me, O Lord. He asked him to test him. That's the only way you're going to know. But you know what? When we as Christians persevere, we don't get a little medal to run around or wear around our necks. It says we're given the crown of eternal life. It's eternal. Lasts forever. I'm pretty sure that little medal I got, if I put it out in the rain, it's not going to still be the same color that it was when I got it. 
I'm pretty sure it's not solid gold. But you know what? The gift of eternal life is just that. It's eternal. James goes on here in verse 12, the second half says, For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. 2 Peter 3, 9, Peter wrote this. He said, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as many count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is very patient with all of us. We're going to open the altar here in a minute. And God is there. You can find Jesus at the altar. He's patiently waiting. He wants you to pass every test that comes. Do you understand that? When he gives you a test, he does not want to see you fail. Not only that, when he sets you out on a test, he's there rooting for you. He is your cheerleader. He wants you to be with him for eternity. He wants you to repent. He wants you to receive salvation. And he wants you to be with him forever. When the altar's open, I'll be glad to pray with you this morning for something that you're going through. I would especially be glad to pray with you if you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you've never come to him and say, Lord God, I need a Savior. I'm unable to do this. I put everything within your hands. I would love to do that this morning. Let you walk into an eternity with Christ. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've opened your altar unto us. Lord God, receive us even now as we come unto you. Lord God, hear our petitions. Lord God, answer them, O Lord God, in your will. Give us what we need, Lord God. Heavenly Father, fulfill every desire within us that directs us back to you. We thank you, Lord God, for the test that you placed upon us. And we thank you, Lord God, for giving us the ability to persevere. We're so thankful in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.